So it is a big pleasure for me uh, to introduce uh, Rune Hauptson uh, from NTNU uh, in Trondheim, uh, who is going to talk about homotopic coherent distributivity and the universal proper property of bispans. Uh, Rune, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot for uh, inviting me to speak here. Um, so I wanted to start the talk by commenting on how it would be much nicer to be in Barcelona right now because it's oh. so uh, cold in Trondheim this week. But unfortunately, somehow Drew managed to have the same idea. So he made that joke in his talk yesterday. So I'm not going to say do that. And I'll just <laughs> start with going straight to the, the math. 35 degrees. So how is it today in, in, in Trondheim? Yeah, this morning it was minus uh, 15. Oh. Yeah, same as yesterday and 20 here. 20 here? Oh man, well. Right, so uh, yeah, so I'm talking about this project, which is joint with uh, Eldon El Manto and kind of the, the ultimate goal of our uh, project is kind of to uh, give some kind of st structural description of uh, these kind of fancy ring spectra that occur in uh, Motivic and extravariant homotopy theory and uh, things like that. So, um, So, for example, you know, in a covariant homotopy theory, that kind of notion of a genuine commutative ring spectrum uh, is something more complicated than just an ordinary uh, infinity ring. You're supposed to have uh, some kinds of like multiplicative uh, transfer maps. Along subgroup inclusions, um, <clears throat> so I mean, in some sense, this is a kind of classical notion of a, of a commutative ring spectrum invariant homotopy theory because you get these if you look at say strict commutative rings in orthogonal spectra uh, or something. But maybe the importance of these transfers is really uh, well was really pointed out by by. Uh, the covariant variant one paper of Hopkins and Ravenel, and there's you know, been quite a lot of work on this these kind of structures since. Um, and then in the motivic context, you have this notion of uh, normed uh, motivic spectra. That was studied by um, uh, Bachmann and Rua. And so here the idea is that you kind of have multiplication maps uh, along all uh, finite and tall maps between schemes. Um, so this is, so, right, so the kind of ultimate goal of our, our joint project is to understand these structures better, but th this isn't quite what I'm gonna get to today. We haven't gotten that far yet, but um, <clears throat> uh, what I'm gonna talk about today is our paper, is the what's in the paper that's uh, already in the archive where we construct, um, Kind of categorical versions of such structures uh, by uh, using a universal property, which is the this universal property of bispans in the title here. Um, <clears throat> so the simplest case uh, that I'm going to focus on for the first part of the talk is the fact that if you have um, if you have a symmetric monoidal category or infinity category where the tensor product uh, is compatible with finite coproduct so it preserves uh, finite coproducts in each variable uh, then 
you have a uh, commutative semi-ring structure where the multiplication is the tensor product uh, and the sum is the co-product in the category. Um, <clears throat> more interestingly, we get analogous structures in the, say, the covariant and motivic uh, context as well. Um, but uh, the first thing that I want to do is to explain, well, what, are, what do I mean by bispans and how are they related to commutative semi-rings? Um, but it's easiest to explain that if I first look at the even sim the simpler case where sort of bias spans you just have spans and relate those to commutative monoids. Um, <clears throat> Let me write uh, black or bold F for the category of finite sets. And then I can define a uh, category span F more precisely, it's, uh, it should be a two comma one category. So it has morphisms and then it has isomorphisms between them, it's rich in groupoids. Uh, so here the objects are just finite sets. So same as the objects of F and then a morphism from I to J is a span. So uh, maps another set X and with maps from X to I and J. And then you should compose these by forming pullbacks. So if I have two spans, say X going from I to J and then Y going from J to K, then uh, to compose them, I take the pullback of these two maps to J. And then I have maps from that, of course, by composing here to I and K and so this outer blue span is the composition in the category. Uh, and since pullbacks are not, uh, you know, they're only defined up to unique isomorphism, even in, uh, even in finite sets, this is uh, most naturally a two one category where the, the two morphisms are just isomorphisms of spans. So if I have X and X prime mapping both mapping to I and J, then a two morphism would be a, an isomorphism from X to X prime compatible with those maps. Um, <clears throat> so you don't have non-invertible morphism? Two morphisms? Uh, not yet, uh, they will come later. Uh, <clears throat> but, right, so I mean, for, for the moment, I'm just in the most classical setting. So I could really just take the sort of homotopy category where I, identify isomorphic spans, but uh, then you have to find more notation for that. So I'm not gonna do that. Uh, right. But now let's just imagine we have a commutative monoid M uh, in, in say the category of sets, uh, then we can define a functor from this to one category span F to set. And since set is an ordinary category, that's the same as just you could just as well quotient by these isomorphisms of spans and get a one category and map out of that. Uh, well, but we can define such a functor by taking the finite set I to M to the I. So if you like the set of functions from I to M or the product of I copies of M. Um, and then for span, um, With maps F and G, I take the composite first of a map I'll call F upper star from MI to MX. And then I have a map I'll denote G lower tensor from MX to MJ. And what do these do? This one is just a uh, composition with F. So if I start with a function uh, phi, uh, 
from i to m, then it gets taken to the function f upper star phi, which sends little x and x to uh, phi of f of x. Uh, and then <clears throat> this g lower tensor is the one that uses the monoid structure. So here uh, I can do a sort of fiber wise multiplication. So if I start again with phi uh, in uh, from x to m, then g lower tensor of phi evaluated at j is supposed to be the product over the x's that lie in the fiber xj of phi of x, where this product is exactly the multiplication in the monoid. Um, then to see that this is a functor, we can look at a pullback square so if I have two maps, G and H from X and Y to J, and I have H prime and G prime living in the pullback square, then uh, the two ways of going around are the same in the sense that if I, if I start with uh, phi in M to the X, then H upper star G lower tensor of phi evaluated at some little y is the product over, uh, if we unwind the definitions, the product over those x that lie in the fiber x sub h of y. So h of y is an element of j, and then I take the fiber of that, and then phi of x, while if I go around uh, in this direction, then I get g prime lower tensor h prime upper star of phi of y as the product over say t in the fiber product sub y, so the fiber of g prime at little y and <clears throat> phi of h prime of t. And then the point is that uh, this uh, map h prime gives a canonical isomorphism between uh, this fiber and this fiber. And so these are the same. So using that plus, uh, we also have uh, that F lower tensor, G lower tensor is the same as F G lower tensor. Uh, this just follows from associativity of the multiplication. Uh, and then, well, these upper stars also compose. Uh, and so combining these facts, we get, we get this functor that I, I claimed in this way. Um, and in fact, you can check that any functor Uh, f from uh, span f to set that preserves a product. Uh, so the, this category span f has products and they're actually given by the disjoint union of finite sets. So uh, this function will preserve products exactly if you have the, the natural map from f of i to the i index product of f of a point is an isomorphism. Um, so if, in this case, uh, well, any such functor uh, arises uh, from a commutative monoid in this way. Uh, and this gives an equivalence of categories and more generally, this works if you have any uh, category with finite products. Then, uh, let's say the category of commutative monoids in C is equivalent to the category of functors from span f to c that preserve uh, finite products. Um, and um, another way of saying this is that this uh, span f, or more precisely, it's kind of one categorical truncation 
is the Louvert theory for commutative monoids. Uh, and uh, the reason I don't want to truncate is that if I just leave this as a 2 1 category, and this is also, this equivalence is also true homotopically. So you can show that uh, commutative monoids in an infinity category C uh, with finite products can be described as uh, product preserving uh, functors from span F to C. So there are a couple of, you know, I think the earliest version of this, this result that I'm aware of is in the thesis of uh, James Crunch. And then there are other proofs, I guess, as, as special cases of various generalizations of this result. So there's one by Saul Glassman um, and one by Anton Harpaz as a special case. Uh, I guess Glassman is doing something with like some notion of G commutative monoids uh, and Harpaz is talking about uh, these M commutative monoids that occur in, in M dexterity. Um, probably there are others. It's, it's also proved in the Bachmann R paper. And yeah. Um, okay. So that's that's well. This is so. This is kind of the, the what I was wanted to to mention as the relation between commutative monoids and spans. So. Uh, now let's look at the case of, of uh, commutative semi-rings and, and bias bands. Maybe I should mention uh, at least once that what I mean by a semi-ring is just a ring where I don't assume that there are negatives. So. Um, so you have multiplication and addition, uh, and you have this usual distributivity law between them, but you don't have uh, negatives for the addition necessarily. Um, right, so in, in the commutative semi-ring, uh, we have two operations and we want to kind of encode both of them in something that's analogous to spans. Um, and since there are two kind of forwards pushing uh, operations, uh, this, well, you might, it's reasonable to guess that uh, the answer should be uh, something like the following. So we want some kind of 2, 1 category by span of F where, well, again, the objects are just finite sets and morphisms from I to J are what I'm calling bi-spans of my to J, which, which I mean diagrams like this, where I have one backwards leg and two forwards legs. Oh, should be a J. And these are also known as uh, polynomial diagrams. Um, in connection with uh, well, one, one of the several notions of polynomial functors are they so very relevant. Um, right, so the, we should have this is the morphisms and uh, then any uh, commutative uh, semi-ring gives R, uh, gives a functor from bi-span of F to set again given our objects by taking i to the set of functions from i to r and then well if we have a bias band we should get for composition of the following map so we have f upper star which is the same as it was before just restrict along f and then we have g lower tensor which is fiber wise multiplication in the ring and then we have H, what I'm calling H lower plus, which is fiber wise addition. Um, so. 
And so like define this as uh, as I was talking about for mono, it's just using the multiplication and addition in, in my ring structure on R. Um, so and then the question is how on earth are you supposed to compose these bispans so that this is a functor? Um, so uh, maybe the first observation, just copying what we had before is that if, if I have a pullback square, so I have two maps, G and H, J, pullback, then uh, by the same argument as, as we had before, we get that H upper star G tensor is G prime lower tensor H prime upper star and H star G lower plus is G prime lower plus H prime upper star. Um, and then the more, but then, well, and the pluses and tensors and stars, like if you stick two of them together, they compose as you expect. And then the non-trivial uh, thing to work out is how you compose, um, I switch to U and V here, I have two maps, a U from I to J and V from J to K. Um, I want to look at uh, V, Lower tensor and u plus evaluated at phi. So, so this is phi is now in r to the i, and I evaluate that at some k and k. Uh, if I expand out what the definitions give me, this is the product over uh, j sub k, the fiber of v at k, and then for each j, I take the sum over the fiber of u at that, so i sub j, of the value of i over i. So it's a product of sums. And then, of course, we have the distributive law in this ring. We can multiply this out, and we can write this in the following form. Now we take the sum over, um, well, what we're indexing over is really the product set, uh, product over j and j sub k, I, J, so, so I'm, I'm picking you know, for each, um, for each J, I pick one of these indices in I, J and I multiply those together. Um, so, I, so I have some list I sub J and then for each of those, I'm, I have a product and that product is over T say in JK, just pick a different letter, and then phi of I sub T, which is an element of I indexed by T in JK. So, um, right. So this is one way of writing down the distributive law in this, in this ring, if you want to make it more complicated than usual. Um, so, um, well, so we can use, so we see that we have here something that looks like it should be something lower plus and then composed with something lower tensor, which is uh, the kind of thing we want if we are composing the, the bispans and uh, we want to put this in this exact order where the lower plus is the last one following the lower tensor. So um, we can describe what's going on here using uh, what we're calling a, uh, distributivity diagram in finance sets. So if I, I start with these two maps, U and V, I can make a new map over K. Uh, so I'll call this V lower star I. So V lower star i, the idea is that I take uh, the fiber at k is the product over jk of uh, the fiber ij. So this is the, so this V lower star is the right to join to pull back along V uh, in sets. Uh, so I take, I make a new set where I multiply together the fibers. Um, so I can do that and then I can pull this thing back along V, so I get V upper star, V lower star I. And now I have to make names for these. So um, let's call this one U prime, this one V prime. And then this, I have a canonical map from this pullback 
So epsilon, which is, this is the uh, co-union for the subjunction between the V upper star and V lower star, a pullback and where V upper star is pullback. More explicitly, I can describe it by saying that V upper star, V lower star I at J is by definition, the product over all the guys T that live in the same fiber as J. So G sub V of J, I sub T. And then I get a map to I sub J just by projecting to that one index in this product. And then this, I can rewrite uh, this, uh, this distributivity identity here uh, by saying that the right-hand side here is, um, you can describe that in terms of this diagram by saying that uh, V tensor U plus is U prime plus V prime tensor epsilon upper star. If you expand the definition, you'll see you get exactly this identity here. And this, this is how you're supposed to compose if a lower tensor and a lower plus, uh, if they're in the wrong order. And you can combine this with uh, these other uh, identities that we had to just to see that uh, you want bispans to compose. Uh, that we get, well, this construction gives us a functor if we compose Uh, bispans as follows. So I have two bispans. Uh, well, first thing I can do is take a pullback here. And then uh, when this, uh, this, this is a low plus, this is an upper star. And so I can Move, move us in the other order by taking the pullback. So this is an upper star, this maps, this maps to a, a lower plus. And now I have lower plus, lower tensor, and I have to do this distributivity construction, diagram construction for that. So I push this map forward and pull back to make this distributivity diagram. Um, well, and so now, <laughs> Now, both of these guys are supposed to be upper stars. And so I can pull back along this map, which goes to a lower tensor and get another pullback here. And then the composite by span is this, this, this. So, um, right. So this is kind of complicated and you could imagine that if you wanted to use this to define some kind of like by category with explicitly chosen coherences, uh, you would be pretty annoyed. Um, but uh, you can actually work that out. I mean, you can like sort of combinatorially define uh, find such a two uh, one category and this, I think, I don't know if this is the oldest reference, but it is, it is worked out in the thesis of, of Crunch again. Uh, another easier construction is to uh, identify these kinds of diagrams with uh, certain functors called polynomial functors. And then this complicated composition is, you know, it becomes identified with composition of these functors. Uh, and so we can define this more easily if, uh, via these polynomial functors. Uh, this is in the paper of uh, Gambino and Koch. Um, but it might also be older in terms of the you know, work going back quite a while on polynomial functors in various settings. Um, and then you can check that uh, commutative semi-rings uh, in some ordinary category C, uh, it's the same thing as functors from uh, by span of F to see that preserve 
finite products. Um, and this, again, I'm not really sure if this is the original reference, but at least one reference for this is, again, this paper of Van Bien and Kopp. Uh, so this, you can say this says that the, uh, the one category of bispans is the Lovea theory for commutative semi-rings. And um, well, we certainly expect that you know, if we take this two one category of bispans, then this is should also be true uh, also for infinity categories. Uh, but so if you define the commutative semi-rings as product preserving functions from bispans, this should uh, this should agree, for example with uh, the definition of those given in the paper of uh, Gepner, Groth, and Nicolaus. So, right, so this is what the connection between summer rings and pi spans is or maybe it's expected to be in the infinity setting. Uh, and then um, <clears throat> there is sort of one source of, of kind of canonical examples of such things, uh, which is that if I have a symmetric monoidal infinity category, well, this is the same example I mentioned before where the tensor uh, preserves finite co products, and this, this should be canonically a uh, commutative semi ring in cat infinity. And indeed, this, this example is, is also in this paper of Gepner Gord Nicolaus. Um, but uh, the simplest version of our theorem gives this. Uh, um, this uh, canonical example as uh, by using the universal property of a two category of bispans where we add in some non-invertible two morphisms. Um, so the next part of the talk, I'd like to explain this universal property uh, of the two category of bispans. Uh, but again, it's easier if I first say something about the analogous uh, you know, as a property in the simpler case of uh, just spans. So that's the next thing I want to talk about, the universal property of the two category of spans. So you could say the analog of this canonical example there would be that if you have a uh, a category with uh, finite products, then it has a canonical symmetric monoidal structure, uh, which of course is already well known without having to use the universal property, but this is one way to, uh, to obtain it. So, um, right, so here's a definition. If I have some X, some infinity two category, and I have some functor phi from contravariant functor from phi and sets to x, then I'll say that phi is right adjointable if the following holds. So for every map f from i to j in phi and sets, uh, f upper star, which is just the notational for phi of f, uh, this is a map in the two category X. And I demand that this has a right adjoint, uh, which I'll call F lower star in X. And then for every pullback square of finite sets, F from I to J, and then uh, G from G prime uh, to J, and then I call back you get G prime and F prime. Uh, well, for every such square, I get a square uh, of upper star maps in X. 
And uh, using these uh, right adjoints that I uh, have uh, asked for in the first point, I can make a canonical transformation from f upper star and g lower star to g prime lower star f prime upper star. This is the mate or Beck Chevrolet transformation. You just build it out of by composing uh, units and co-units and um, and uh, the, the fact that you have this commutative square. Um, so, and then the, the requirement is that if this square was a pullback square in finite sets, then this transformation uh, should be an equivalence. It should be invertible in the two category, infinity two category X. Um, <clears throat> and then the claim is that there is a two, the two category of, of spans uh, classifies or represents uh, these right adjointable functors. So, you know, the following theorem, or rather, a special case of the theorem. That um, functors from f up to x that are right adjointable are equivalent to just arbitrary functors from capital span f to x, where this capital span f uh, is a two category that enhances what I was talking about before, little span of f with non-invertible two morphisms. <clears throat> uh, so if I have two one morphisms, I have two spans uh, with the same source and target like this, then a two morphism is just asking for a map between the tips of the two spans compatible with the projection. So that you can define such a two category and the claims that this has this universal property of representing right adjointable functors. So, uh, well, there are various names to put here. So, uh, some, to some extent, this is in the book of Case Curry and Rosenblum. But um, I mean, they talk a lot, they talk about this, but they they um, they only give kind of a sketch of the proof. Um, and then the first proof in full detail is by Andrew McPherson. Um, and there's also a, uh, a more recent paper of Stefanich, uh, a proof of this that sort of gen also generalizes it to uh, n fold spans in the, the n, so the n category of, uh, yeah. It has like a higher version of this for uh, uh, where you iterate the span construction. Um, and I should also mention for, for you know, if I take X to be an ordinary two category and drop the infinities, and this is, uh, this is a, uh, well, just was I uh, am aware the first published version of this is in the paper of uh, Almeida. Um, and so, I mean, I stated this for just for finite sets, but you can replace, uh, you can replace F here uh, by any, any infinity category, say C with pullbacks, maybe just along some class of maps. Some class of maps. Uh, so C sub F. And so uh, with that, the idea being that instead of looking at all spans, you can look at just those spans where the forward map lies in this class F uh, of forward pointing maps, so to say. And then uh, you want to, pullbacks of an arbitrary map along a map and F to exist so that you still have the composition by taking pullbacks. Uh, and then the universal property is that you, you have these right adjoints exactly for those maps that lie in this class F and then that allows you to extend them, uh, extend your spans. Uh, uh, 
Right, so this is uh, what happens for spans. Uh, and you can check if you have, I mean, um, just, you know, we'll mention this example of, of products. So if I take, if I have an infinity category C, any infinity category C, well, I can certainly define a functor from F up to cat infinity by taking a file set I to the set of maps from I to C, so an I index product of copies of C, uh, and just with a map F going to F of a star from CJ to CI just by composition uh, restriction along F. Uh, this is a functor that exists certainly. And then I can ask when this is right adjointable. Uh, this is right adjointable if and only if C has finite products. And um, this is, you know, this, these writer joints here, writer joints to these restriction maps will exactly exist if you have finite products and they're given by taking you know, fiber-wise indexed products. Uh, and then this adjointability condition is actually automatic because uh, if you work out what's going on here, you're kind of multiplying along the fibers of the two maps and they're isomorphic. So, uh, so that just falls out automatically here. Um, and then, so in this case, if we have finite products, then we get a functor of infinity two categories from span F to capital cat infinity, which is the notation I'm using for the infinity two category of categories. Um, And then, um, uh, I see I already answered the question in the chat, so uh, that's great. Um, so um, yeah, we get this functor and then we can restrict it to one category. And this exactly gives us uh, the symmetric, the commutative monoid. We get the commutative monoid structure using the Cartesian product. So a symmetric monoidal structure given by the Cartesian product. Um, okay, so now, uh, uh, now let's move on to bispans. And since I'll at least manage to state the, the theorem before the end of the talk, that's good. Uh, so we want to have a notion property in analogous to this in the context of bispans. Now we ask for the following. We have an infinity two category X and a functor five from the one category, the two one category of spans to X. So I ask for this to be, uh, so this is distributive if the following conditions hold. So first of all, five restricted to F up should be uh, left adjointable. So that's just the dual of the uh, the previous notion of right adjointable. So F upper star should have a left joint I'll denote by F lower plus. Uh, and this has this uh, invertible back Chevrolet transformation uh, for Cartesian squares. Um, and second, if I have a distributivity diagram, if I have too much F and G, and I do this and push forward and pull back construction, let's say I call this H and G prime and epsilon. Uh, and I use the following notation that F upper star is phi evaluated on a backwards map F. So 
this span, where the forward leg is an identity and F lower tensor is just the notation. We ended up with a lot of different uh, kinds of stars showing up in the paper. So we started to call these maps uh, F lower tensor just to avoid confusion. Um, so this is phi valued at the forwards, uh, span with just the forwards leg, non-trivial. Okay, so from this distributivity diagram, I can make now, uh, and these are uh, these adjoints that I asserted existed in the first condition, uh, I can make a natural transformation from H lower plus G prime lower tensor epsilon upper star to, um, uh, to uh, G lower tensor F lower plus uh, as follows. I mean, this this is also a beck chevalet transformation, by the way, uh, but for a different square in X. So I can insert um, the adjunction for F. So I use the unit for the, for the adjunction between F upper star and F lower plus. And then I can rewrite this, uh, you know, epsilon. Mm. Uh, this is the same as F epsilon upper star, which is this composite. And then I, I have this pullback square. So I have, I know that um, just from the structure of the functor phi, I have to have uh, an identification of uh, pull push identification for this pullback square. So if I pull back here and then do a lower tensor, that's this. It's identified with doing the lower tensor here and then um, pulling back. So I can rewrite this as H lower plus um, H upper star H. Um, no, not H. Uh, now G lower tensor F lower plus. And now I have the co unit of the adjunction between H plus and H star, and I get. So I can remove that and I end up at G lower tensor F lower plus. And so this is the, uh, I have this transformation canonically and I ask for this uh, to be invertible. This should be an equivalence in the two category X. <clears throat> so then the theorem or the special case for just for finite sets of the theorem is that uh, there is a two category of bias bands that uh, that represents these distributive functors. So I just read it a formula like this so distributive functors from span F to X are equivalent to arbitrary functors. Infinity two counts from capital by span of F to X. Uh, and so well, what is this capital by span? It's a two, two categorical enhancement uh, of, of a little by span where the two morphisms Our diagrams of the following shapes. So I have two bias bands with the same source and target, like this. Um, well, I should have a commutative diagram like this, but I have, and this is important to so say that the square in the middle shouldn't be an arbitrary square. This has to be a pullback square. Um, so these are the two morphisms that are in this uh, two category of bias bands. Um, so, um, and part of, well, I mean, there are kind of two, you know, really there are kind of two parts of this theorem. One is that, uh, there exists some infinity two category that represents the distributive functors. That's actually not so hard to show. And then the most of the work goes into actually identifying that two category that has that universal property with, um, with, uh, 
a two category of bias bands. So we identify the objects, the morphisms with bias bands and the two morphisms with these diagrams and the composition with this uh, fairly complicated uh, composition law that I described earlier. Um, so, right, and I should mention that, uh, well, we can replace, uh, uh, we can replace more generally F by any, uh, any infinity category, uh, so C with suitable classes of maps uh, CF and CL uh, such that, uh, well, appropriate pullbacks uh, and distributivity diagrams exist. Um, so you can um, so I, I gave this fairly explicit description of distributivity diagrams in uh, in finite sets, but if you uh, if you think of it in terms of um, categorical abstract terms, then this is you could ask for such diagrams to exist, which is it's kind of partially asking for this right adjoint to pull back to exist. Um, you could ask for that with respect to these some suitable classes of maps in an infinity category. Uh, so, for example, this always uh, these always exist if you have a, a locally Cartesian closed infinity category. <clears throat> um, right. So and then, uh, right. and then you get you get an infinity two category by span sub f. L of C, where the morphisms are by spans where the middle map is required to lie in F and the um, new, the last node is right to lie in L and the universal properties in terms of starting with something from spam F, so the forward maps are in F and the distributivity condition is for, you know, you should have these left joints uh, for maps in L. Um, and I should also mention that the, the version of this for ordinary uh, two categories uh, this you know the property is due to uh, the thesis of uh, Charles Walker so, so okay um, Right, maybe, yeah, I will see and describe this example that I've mentioned several times already. So if I have a symmetric monoidal infinity category, then um, something I said early on is that we can describe such, uh, so we can always describe commutative monoids as uh, product preserving functions from spans. So we can, I can view this symmetric monoidal structure as being given by a functor from spans of finite sets to get infinity. And uh, well, which takes i to c to the i, and then uh, f upper star is this composition, but f lower star is a fiber wise, it's the fiber wise tensoring. Uh, you can also, we have we, every symmetric model category gives such a functor, and now we can ask when is it, uh, when is it distributive? So uh, then you can work out what this means in this case, and you see that these, this f upper star has these, uh, will have these left joints uh, for all f precisely when uh, c has finite co products. And then these are just given by fiber-wise uh, taking co-products in C. Uh, and with the jointability condition again being automatic because you're taking co-products over the fibers of two maps in the pool like square, and those are canonically isomorphic. Uh, also then given this left jointability is automatic in this case. And for this to be distributive, uh, 
we can check this, this distributive if and only if the tensor product distributes over co-product in the sense that uh, you know, tensoring with a co-product is a co-product of tensor products so, or tensor preserves co-product in each variable. So in this case, we get a functor from capital by span of F to capital cat infinity. Um, and if you forget the two morphisms, this is exactly describing a, well, if you, if you still believe this, uh, well, if you believe this equivalence between uh, product preserving functors from by spans and committed to semi rings in some other sense, then this is exactly describing the ring structure you get from the tensor product and the co-product. Okay. Um, let's see, were there any questions about this? Uh, not. Um, right, so th this is, uh, yeah. This is what I wanted to say about uh, the case of finite sets. And then the, the last part of the talk, I want to discuss some other examples of bispans and distributivity. Um, so a first example is to, instead of looking at finite sets, we can look at bispans in the infinity category of spaces. So, um, in fact, you know, you can extend this, this, uh, this construction here where you take a symmetric model category and you get a functor from spans. Uh, you can extend that to say, to show that any uh, symmetric monoidal infinity category C gives a functor from span fin of spaces S is the infinity category of spaces or infinity groupoids. I'm still refusing to call them anime, but uh, um, maybe I will be convinced eventually. And that's this fin is referring to the fact that I want the forge morphisms to have finite discrete fibers. And so the idea is that since the, the fibers are finite and discrete, I can still do a push forward operation where I tensor over that finite set. Uh, and I always have restriction maps coming from, uh, just by restricting along a map of, of, of uh, spaces, uh, yeah, that um, always exists. Uh, like F of a star is restrict along F. So it takes it takes a space X to the set of functors from a space the category of functors from X to C, uh, F of a star restriction and F lower tensor is a fiberized tensor product, which makes sense because I'm requiring the, the fiber to be a finite set. Um, <clears throat> you can ask when this functor is distributive. Uh, And this works out to be that it's distributive uh, if, with respect to all maps as the added, as the the left joins, if and only if the tensor product preserves. Well, C has uh, colimits indexed by infinity groupoids, and the tensor product preserves these in each variable. So if you have such a C, then you, our theorem produces a functor of infinity category, two categories from by spans of fin. So if, if I'm just restricting the middle maps, I'll just put that one thing down. I won't say like fin all for, I'm just assuming that the, the final leg is all then. So this is by span fin of S to count infinity. Um, so, we get this, and this is uh, one reason this is interesting is that because you this infinity two category by span fin of s, uh, we can identify this with the infinity two category of 
uh, of um, analytic functors uh, uh, which uh, was defined in uh, my paper with, uh, with uh, David Gepner and Joachim Koch. Well, we also proved that monads here are uh, Or the same thing as infinity operands, or to be precise, I should say something like pinned or flagged infinity operands. This means that I'm, uh, you know, we actually identify them with chondroidal Siegel spaces without acquiring, acquiring completeness. So this is kind of saying you have an infinity operand and then you have a, uh, an essentially subjective map from some other infinity group wide to the infin underlying infinity group wide of, the, of that. Anyway, so. The point is that this this uh, formal construction uh, from our theorem produces this, and then if you have a monad in here, that's an infinity operand. So if you, so this gives us an action of any infinity operand on any symmetric monoidal infinity category that's compatible with such colimits. Uh, and then you might ask, well, is that actually the normal action that you get? And that's uh, then I just have to say I don't know. That's it's one of those annoying things that is like harder than you want it to be to prove for infinity categories, but of course it should be. Um, right. Um, maybe, yeah, so I want, so, right. so that was spaces. Now I want to look at another variant where we replace finite sets with finite G sets uh, for some finite group G. Ah, and finite. G spaces. No, yeah. So if G is some finite group, I'll write FG for the category of finite uh, G. Oh, I mean, I mean to say finite G sets, not finite spaces. Um, all right, and you can you can think of this as being obtained by freely adding direct sums uh, from the orbit category if you like that. Any finite G set is a finite just on union of orbits. Um, so you could look no, and this and this is in this variant setting you can ask for um, um, you can ask for uh, the analog of of commutative uh, monoids. As we defined them before in terms of spans, this would be a functor from uh, spans of finite G sets to sets preserving uh, preserving finite products. Again, the the product in the category of spans comes from the co-product of finite G sets, and so this is like almost the same thing as a Mackey functor. Uh, You get a Mackey functor exactly if you ask for, uh, if I have this this structure, then I get a, a multiplication on every, uh, on the value on every orbit. And I can ask for that multiplication to actually have inverses uh, so that I'm landing in, in abelian groups rather than just commuted in monoids. So it's like a Mackey functor minus one condition that you can ask for if you want. Uh, So, uh, so I claim that you can, uh, well, you can, well, we can certainly make the following definition that a, a G commutative monoid uh, in infinity category C with finite products is a uh, product preserving functor from spans of finite G sets. And then we have the following theorem, which uh, in the form of stating it, I'm going to attribute it to Dennis Nodden. Um, but sort of, it's kind of a version of you know a lot of work that has gone on before that in terms of uh, extravariant uh, infinite loop space theory. Uh, but in this infinity categorical model, you can prove it that we have the following equivalence between group-like uh, G commutative monoids. 
in spaces and connective genuine G spectra. With this group like is exactly this condition of having inverses for the multiplication. It's like, uh, like you ask for a, uh, for an, so, uh, you know, and, and all, <laughs> if you drop the group, then you have the notion of group like commutative monoids as being once where you have oh, what happened now. Okay, I think we're back. Uh, it's always some fun challenges with this new technology. Um, <clears throat> Pretty sure when Blackboard talks, the Blackboard never started showing a paper I was reading. Um, anyways, uh, we have this equivalence between group like commutative monoids, which are where we have the multiplications that you have in pi zero have inverses. And that's the same as connective G spectra. So we might then expect, well, we could then look at the analog of semi ring, commutative semi rings, where we replace F by FG. So, uh, we call those uh, G commutative semi rings. Function from by span of FG and to set, uh, well, well, just any C, uh, preserving finite products. And then if we take C equals set, then we exactly get what are called Timbara functors, except we're again missing these uh, without these inverses. So there you might call them like semi Timbara functors or something. So a Timbara functor would exactly be one of these uh, G community semi instance sets where all the mono structures you had were actually abelian group structures, which is a property important. Uh, and Right, and then we would so we would again expect. Uh, so this hasn't, as I was saying earlier, this isn't even like really known for uh, for the non-group case, but we, we would expect that group-like G commutative uh, semi rings in spaces are the same thing as connective like, genuine G ring spectra. And here I mean the kind of fancy version of these. Uh, in particular, this this is not the same thing as just an infinity algebra in, in G spectra. Uh, you have more structure than that. Um, right. So now, uh, uh, right. So so this you know if you believe that these are reasonable things to look at, you could you can try and apply our theorem to construct some. Uh, functors from capital by span of, of G to categories as we were doing uh, before. Um, if I have a, a G symmetric monoidal category, that would be a G commutative monoid. Uh, uh, in uh, span of FG to cat infinity. Uh, well, if it is distributive, well, by the theorem, we get a functor from capital by span of G, capital cat infinity. So here, this distributivity condition doesn't really reduce uh, to anything. Well, it doesn't. No. Um, the the adjoint the left adjointability part of it. Uh, you can expand out into a double coset condition. Uh, so that's kind of nice, but the distributivity uh, for the distributivity diagrams, it seems it doesn't simplify that much uh, in general. Um, but uh, we have some examples of such distributive G commutative monoids. So if I, if I have any symmetric monoidal category, infinity category with just on union and tensor preserves uh, core products. I can look at uh, kind of G objects with a G action in C. And this fun, so I can just think of as functors from BG into C. This extends to, 
to a distributive uh, G community monode, G commute, well, yeah, let's say that, G community monode and cut. For example, you could take C2E vector spaces, and then this is uh, so sort of a sub example. If I take C2E vector spaces, and this is like the structure on uh, on representations uh, from uh, well, we have restriction restrictions to subgroups, and well. You know, the, the lower plus maps correspond to all the induction of representations in the usual sense, where we take a, a sum and then we have a group and induced action on that. Uh, and then the, the lower tensor maps are another construction that is maybe less familiar, but is, has also appeared in, in the representation theory, where you look what's called tensor induction, where you instead of summing things, you tensor them together and get an induced action on the tensor product. Um, Right, so the, the uh, yeah, so if this uh, tensor product we start with preserves just on unions, then we get something that is distributed over here. Um, and then a sort of a less formal example is that of G spectra, um, which is not induced in this way. Um, right. So I see I don't have much time left. Um, yeah, maybe I will at least, I want to mention this uh, application, which is uh, based on what Thomas talked about yesterday. So yeah, I think that's how you spell application. It's not a word I get to use very much in my line of work. Um, that was the best joke of the talk, by the way. So don't expect anything uh, better. So if I have such a uh, distributive uh, G commutative monoid, uh, where C is stable, but well, I should have a bit, you know, like really, I, I should probably want this tensor product to also preserve uh, uh, finite co-limits rather than just co-products, but uh, then from this, this construction, uh, from our theorem, we get, uh, I believe we get a functor from in infinity category of bounce bands and finite T sets to this infinity category of stable infinity categories and polynomial functors that appeared in Thomas's talk yesterday. And then uh, by the theorem of uh, that he talked about, we have a functor extending like loops infinity of K theory to, to that uh, polynomial category of polynomial functors. So this is theorem of Bowick, Glassman, uh, Matthew and Nicholas. So if you have this, this tells us that, you know, if I have such G commutative monostructure uh, say C, then the K theory of C is a uh, group what was I calling it? It's a group like G commutative uh, semi ring, which should be the same as um, connective uh, G ring, commutative, connective commutative G commutative ring spectrum. Um, and I think I think this is actually a new. Like this is an extension of the previously known structures on, on K-theory in this case. Uh, so, right. Um, yeah, okay, I'm out of time. So let me just mention very briefly some other variants that you could look at. So in our paper, we look at a Mativic version. Uh, where we take schemes. Uh, schemes over S with uh, find at all maps and uh, smooth, well, smooth and quasi projective, I guess it has to be. Uh, this, and we show that Mativic spectra, well, yeah, Mativic spectra gives a, uh, a functor. Uh, 
gives a gives a pointer from my span of this guy into cat, and this this is applying our theorem to uh, to work of Bach one and there you are. And we also have another algebraic geometric version where we look at uh, like a perf of schemes and spectral, well, even spectral in Mumford stacks as, uh, as a functor of bias bands. And finally, I should, let me just also very briefly mention that there should be a version of this, this, uh, this is covariant stuff where you replace finite G sets with uh, G spaces and um, you know, just you, you might hope that this, uh, just as I said in the case of bias bands in spaces being related to infinity of prayers, that bias bands in G spaces should be related to uh, some notion of uh, G infinity of prayers, which uh, I guess is part of this uh, big project of Bowick, Dr. Glassman, Nodden, and Shah on uh, like a covariant category theory. Okay, uh, let me stop there. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to unmute to applause. Thanks, Una. Um, oh no, Emma was chairperson now. <laughs> well, I don't mind. Thank you very much, Rune, uh, for your very uh, nice talk, very complete. And uh, also, it answered um, partially one question that I had yesterday for Thomas Nicolaus. Right, because you began at one kind of polynomial functors and you ended up at the others in one of your examples. Well, that's great. I mean, yeah, but I'm not sure. I mean, it's not like. Well, uh, but I, I mean, yes, it's not the same, but it's. Yeah, a well, I don't separate. even know if there's really a connection between them. It's kind of. Well, you showed you know, the connection. Kind of, there are two different things that appear, and people have called both of them polynomial functors. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Um, and also, uh, uh, well, but then I think there is some questions in the chat. Right. I see there is one question about the model for infinity two categories that we use. And we don't actually use any any model of infinity two categories. We are operating entirely at the level of, of uh, you know, we're working within the, the world of infinity categories here. Although one one really key uh, result for us that we use is the Yonadal lemma for infinity two categories, which uh, is proved by by Hinnich as a special case of the Oneida lemma for enriched infinity categories. So you could say we are, in that sense, we are using the model, the description of infinity two categories as infinity categories enriched in infinity categories. Um, but other than that, we really don't have to um, to work with models at all. Uh, I have a question about, uh, sorry, uh, Rune, can I ask a question? How hard do you think it is to show that uh, group like G commutative semi rings are connective G commutative ring spectra? Um, I think I have some idea of how to prove the, like, the non equivariant version, but uh, uh, David Geppner and I were talking about that kind of at MSRI last March and then various things started to happen so we never really finished that but uh i think i'm fairly confident that that's that that idea should work out and then uh how much more complicated it would be in the very case i don't know i haven't really thought about that um i guess i guess dennis's thesis also more or less works out the equivariant version of the Gettner Court Nicolaus stuff. So um, that was like, that's definitely like one big component of the proof. So maybe, maybe that is also doable. Um, Thanks. Any more questions? Uh, yeah, I have a question about the, the equivariant case where um, in the case of spans, if you replace finite G sets by uh, finite free G sets, then you get you get just objects with G action, right? Uh, is that the same thing with bias bands? Uh, I haven't thought about that. Um, like, hmm. uh, 
Maybe. Um, I would have to think about that, but that seems like it seems plausible that, that could just give you like <clears throat> things like, uh, I guess you're thinking of, like I should describe things like infinity, uh, just plain infinity uh, rings in G spectra without the fancy stuff or. Can I, can I, sorry, can I also add to this question? I mean, Potentially, you could also consider families of subgroups and just take like, you know, yeah. orbit categories with respect to families. And then you can get like different versions of these uh, fancy infinity G-ring spectra, which uh -huh. have transfers, which have transfers in. Right, okay, that, that, that I can say a little about. So you have, uh, I guess there, there's, uh, uh, I guess this, there's this, uh, I forget what they call it, but there is something due to uh, Bloomberg and Hill where they, they yeah, can spread. And, 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 and infinity or something, right? Right, but they, they have a sort of notion of families of, of things that can happen in finite G sets uh, that correspond to having restricted types of transfers for the multiplication. Right. Yeah. Uh, and that would correspond to, to restricting, restricting the forward maps in the category of spans. I guess they show they prove that the, the, the structures they consider are the same thing as those families of maps and finite G sets that have this kind of, the property you need to define the category of spans uh, with those as the forward maps. And so, uh, right, then you could, you could go, you know, you could go through the same machinery and you and look at, uh, well, by spans where the middle maps are required to lie in that, in that subclass. Um, those yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Like. But then, then of course, if you take trivial family, I think that's also an example. So I think it should be it should be fine. So uh, right. These are the indexing systems of Bloomberg and Bell. That's what I'm talking about. Uh, that was in the chat. Um, I think the trivial trivial one is one of the indexing systems. In my right. Opinion. Yeah. Uh, and then that's that probably does correspond to having uh, just infinity monoids in. Uh, in uh, in genuine G spectra, since you still have the, right. the additive maps for all uh, some groups, and then <laughs> uh, if you start restricting the kinds of orbits that appear, then you are talking about things that are not all the way up to genuine G spectra, but only G spectra for some universe. Uh, so this should also be a possible variant. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Any further questions? Well, I have a short question, but uh, maybe it missed something, but all the time you were talking about connective spectra, mm. even when you were considering G spectra. Right, I mean, this is, you know, it's like we're kind of passing through the G version of the I don't know, connective spectra are the yeah, same yeah. as group like e infinity monads and spaces. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there is no way that you can take any of these to non-connective spectra? Um, I mean, so I mean, in five, sense, five this, is, this is kind of, in a sense, the next the next part of the story that we haven't worked out that. So we wanna we wanna describe things like uh, commutative ring spectra in terms of bias spans, but it'll be more complicated. It won't just be applying this. Uh, well, it'll be some sort of more complicated because you, this the story here really is applying to the Cartesian case rather than. Uh, Non-Cartesian monosymmetric monoidal structures. But do you have any intuition of uh, how it could it be in the like more classical examples of non-connective spectra? Well, you kind of have to. Or, why, or how, how, how? I mean, how does it fail? Or uh, in which way the the obvious reason why it could fail could be patched? Um, I mean, you have. Uh, I'm not really sure what, what, what. I'm not sure what is a helpful thing to say. Um, like, um, um, I mean, I don't. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know that there is anything like this kind of equivalence if you don't have connective spectra. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Okay. Yeah, so, 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 so what we're kind of aiming for is more on the, the level of rings and talking about uh, G ring spectra as uh, as you know involving by spans, but also involving the category spectra. You don't get to go all the way down to to spaces. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Rune. That was a great talk. Mm. And uh, okay, let us thank Rune again. And uh, uh, don't forget that today we are beginning in the afternoon a bit later because our first speaker uh, is uh, coming from well, is is speaking from the Americas, and uh, so we are beginning at uh, sixteen hours uh, Barcelona time. Okay. That is UTC, uh, what, Andy? Uh, 15, right? Uh, okay, so uh, see you later.